Today I'm going to talk to you before Mike gets on um, about a few insect groups. Uh, and, uh, you know, at this time of year, there's not a lot active. I've got one that'll be pretty good, I think. But, uh, you know, I want to talk about, I haven't really talked about on this program much about paper wasps, hornets, and yellow jackets. So we get a lot of questions about them. I've been getting a lot of questions lately about them. And uh, so I figured I'd address uh, this group of insects. So these are um, insects in the order Hymenoptera, of course. They're bee related bees and wasps, or bees and ants, things like that. Um, and they are in the vet family Vespidae. Uh, so it's a really neat group of uh, wasps. Uh, many are eusocial and have various behaviors. So eusocial means they are truly social. They have uh, a caste system where one is doing the reproduction, the others are workers. Um, they help the young, they have overlapping generations. And so just like ants and bees, these are social insects. Um, there are other Vespidae, like the potter wasps and some pollen wasps in other areas of the country that are not social. So uh, close relatives actually uh, were solitary before they became social. Uh, these insects create small to very large nests out of paper. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, they are sometimes aggressive, especially later in the year and near their nests. And uh, some of you and myself have had the unfortunate occasion to get stung by them. Uh, and so I'll discuss a little bit about that too. Uh, but basically, they are in a group of stinging wasps and will defend their nests because they're social and they have a number of members in the nest. They're going to defend that aggressively, uh, depending on the group. Now, one thing to note is that nests are typically only active for one year. Uh, what happens is that this time of year, uh, we sometimes see mated queens that are coming into homes or coming around homes because they're looking for overwintering sites. Oftentimes, these larger queens go uh, find uh, wood or bark somewhere to overwinter in the leaf litter somewhere like that uh, but our homes also make a good spot so that's one of the reasons i'm bringing it up you'll start to see these wasps enter homes sometimes and in the spring just like some of these other fall invaders they will leave the home to go find and start new nests um, now i put the asterisk there because the these these wasps even within a species are fairly complex some nest in certain other ways and and Apparently, in some of the warmer climates, they may have perennial nests where they will survive year after year and get to huge sizes and numbers of individuals. Um, but how do you know you have a uh, one of these wasps? Let's see. Is it? Let's see. There we go. So how do you tell you have a Vespid wasp? Like I said, there's some potter wasps, some solitary potter wasps that are in this family that'll have these same characteristics. But the two main characters of this group are that they fold their wings longitudinally. Uh, so this is a fairly, there's only one other group of wasps uh, that's fairly rare that would have this. And basically, uh, many of, oftentimes they have dark wings, but sometimes lighter wings. But typically these dark wings are folded along their length and are very strap-like when at rest. When they are in flight, of course, they fold out. They also have a big notch in their eye. So if you're able to get close enough to a specimen or have a dead specimen um, and take a look, you'll see this big notch taken out of the eye. And so those two characteristics are very good for identifying whether you have a Vespid wasp. Again, some of them are solitary, but many of them are gonna be familiar to you. So like I said, they collect uh, wood, they, they make their nests out of paper. They collect wood uh, for making pulp. And usually this wood is from, in nature, of course, dead trees and weathered wood. Uh, but often in human uh, areas, areas where people are living, these are usually things like fence posts. Um, I've had them on a, my kid's uh, playhouse, the wooden playhouse outdoors. This is another post in my garden to hold up some blackberries. But you can see this wasp here is starting to create a ball of pulp. And you can see all these little bite and chew marks. They're almost always going to be along the grain of the wood. And so if you see these little chew marks, or little light lines where the old weathered wood has been chewed away, uh, that's almost certainly going to be some kind of paper wasp or hornet uh, or yellow jacket collecting wood 
for their uh, make paper for uh, nests. Now, as far as food, so adults typically feed on sugary and nutritious liquids, uh, so nectar, honey, slime flux uh, on trees. Uh, like all adult wasps in this group, they can't feed on solid food. They have that narrow waist and only liquids will pass through. So they, they don't feed on solid food themselves. They may, some young queens may uh, capture prey and uh, kind of squish it up and suck the juices out. But otherwise, they are hunting wasps, hunting soft-bodied prey typically, often caterpillars. So they can actually be beneficials in gardens, especially if they're not causing any issues or the nest is nearby. Uh, and those prey items are captured to feed to their larvae, which do have chewing mouth parts, which do have, are able to consume solid parts. Larger species may hunt uh, larger insects and some even scavenge on carrion. So, um, so basically, um, they, you, I've actually seen them come to scraps left af after like a picnic. So they'll come and try and uh, grab some of that meat to feed to their young uh, to keep the colony going. Now, the first group uh, is probably the most common one that you guys see. Uh, these are the paper wasps. They are in the subfamily of Polystyne and are in the genus Polistes. There are several other genera in the tropics. Actually, this one is taken in the Dominican Republic. But uh, basically, they all have a similar form. They're all a little bit narrower, longer wasps. Um, and they form small colonies of about six to 30 individuals. Uh, most people are pretty much familiar with, I think, these wasps in that they create these small open nests, uh, a single layer nest on a stalk. Uh, and actually in some parts of the world and some people call them umbrella wasps because they create these umbrella-like nests. These nests are often found under eaves of houses or in nest boxes, other kind of secluded areas where the wasps can come in out and uh, uh, go to their, their small comb basically. And uh, as you can see, it's typical for these types of wasps, these paper cells uh, have uh, pupae and larvae and eggs uh, at various stages and when they grow up the the sisters stay with the colony and help out. Now behavior in paper wasps is a little bit um, variable. Some of them have, may have a couple dominant females that are almost like queens. Others will only have one dominant female and sometimes they even fight for dominance. It's a uh, very they have very uh, complex behaviors, a lot of these wasps. And even between species, they can do different things. The next group are what we call yellow jackets. Now, uh, unfortunately, there's no taxonomic, uh, it's no real taxonomic distinction between the what are yellow jackets. So two genera, Dolica vespula and vespula, contain what we would normally call yellow jackets. And it typically refers to either ground nesting species or smaller yellow species. So in fact, these two wasps are in different genera. Uh, you can actually tell, this is a little bit technical, but by how far away the eye is from the mandible. So this one, the eye is basically touching the mandible. This genus, this is Dolica vespula, has a longer space in between the mandible and the eye. Uh, but otherwise, if they're flying at you, you're not really going to care about that. These are smallish wasps, but they do create large colonies. And an interesting thing is that many of them do nest underground. And so you'll have a hole and they'll just come out of nowhere, it seems like. But actually, in if that hole leads to a huge cavity underground that has a big paper nest in there. So just because they're underground doesn't mean they don't make paper nests. There are also other aerial nest makers, so some aerial yellow jackets, which will make paper nests up in trees. And this is one of the, this, this group has some of the largest colonies, uh, nests consisting of 500 to 5,000 workers at the height of the activity. So again, if you're close to one of these nests, they can afford to lose a few to defend it. And so they're a little bit more aggressive than uh, many of the other vespid wasps that I'll talk about today. So I know that um, these get disturbed a lot. I've, I've gotten them attacking me when I've pulled weeds near their entrance of their nest or a lawnmower. Uh, so basically, if there's a nest nearby, it's, it's best to try and treat them. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, but basically 
some uh, store-bought uh, chemicals, especially the ones that you can spray from a good distance, the foam, and applying at night when they're le least active is the best method. But always, if you don't feel comfortable with it, because they can be potentially dangerous with many stings, uh, if you don't feel comfortable, definitely call a professional to help. So that's yellow jackets. Uh, and again, it's kind of a loose term for any of these small yellowish hornets. And again, you can see these strap-like longitudinally folded wings here. Now the bald-faced hornet is technically a type of yellow jacket because it is in the genus Dolichovespula, but is a specific species, Dolichovespula maculata. And they are a native uh, hornet and they are, are among our largest vespidae. And it is actually, I think, our, nat our largest native vespid. Um, they're fairly easy to identify because they're largely black or dark colored with pale yellow to white or ivory marks. They don't have that very bright yellow markings and they're mostly black. Um, you can see here, they're fairly heavy bodied um, and these very nice ivory markings all over them. They create large aerial nests, sometimes very high up in the trees or sometimes in the eaves of homes. I got a call about some uh, in the eave of a home, but uh, they are said to be a little bit less aggressive and also because their nests are out of the way more often, they seem to be less of a problem for stinging people, things like that. Um, again, they're, they're fairly large, so they'd probably be pretty painful, but um, they're, they're, they're easy to identify, they're not as aggressive. So again, if you have a nest that's out of the way, that you don't really, you don't have a lot of things defending it, uh, or a lot of members defending it, that's something you may want to just leave because they also perform good services and ecosystem services, especially in gardens where they may be collecting caterpillars for their young. The last one, oh, sorry, and uh, here's a, an example of one of their nests. So they can't get quite large. Uh, sizes of basketballs or even bigger are reported uh, fairly frequently. And uh, you can see the little nest entrance here. Uh, and inside this paper envelope, will be uh, rows, basically uh, uh, rows of combs uh, going down to the bottom. And uh, this is where they produce all their young and live. And uh, from out, out of there, they go and hunt their prey and whatnot. Okay, and lastly, the European hornet. So as the name suggests, this is not native. It was introduced in the US in the late 1800s and it's a genus, it's the only member of the genus Vespa in the North America. I see a question, is, is this an annual nest? Yes, most of those nests are annual because the freeze uh, kills them. Uh, so in regions where it's warmer year round, there may be perennial nests, but here in North Carolina, typically the, the cold weather kills the colony, except for the overwintering queen that'll come out next year and create a new nest. Um, so Vespa uh, crabro, the European hornet, um, is a member of an old world genus, Vespa, uh, introduced here in the late 1800s. So has been here for a long time, obviously. Um, it's our largest Vespid and among the largest wasps in North America. Uh, they routinely get over an inch long, uh, inch and a half is not unheard of. And I'll show you some pictures in a moment about how big they are. But basically very large looking, fairly distinct too. So the head and thorax are mostly this maroon, this dark reddish brown, um, more of a reddish maroon. And then they have this mustard yellow face and, uh, and tip of the abdomen. So it's fairly distinct coloration. The size and that coloration are gonna make it easily distinguishable from all other hornets that we have around here. Um, they do create large paper nests, often in trees. So they may take a tree cavity and create uh, columns of or rows of of these combs uh, but they can also make their own paper nests too and sometimes they'll come into attics and create the paper nest inside there or under the eaves of homes so like with a lot of these hornets and 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 yellow jackets they are fairly variable in what site they pick i've even read that some of the species that have aerial nests may sometimes nest in say fallen logs or even underground some of the underground species may on occasion nest in the in trees and and other places so it's uh 
you can kind of generalize, but it's not always clear cut. And now, I've seen some reference, Matt, to yes. these European hornets collecting uh, bark or, you know, really thin layers of bark off trees. Is that yes is that behavior there yes so that's one thing that's good to mention so they don't only go after the dead wood or the or the seasoned wood um sometimes they will strip uh make big strips of bark take big strips of bark off of live plants so typically what we see is them doing it longitudinally again with the grain um i have seen what people think may be some across the grain around and may girdle plants, but it's difficult unless you catch them in the act to know whether that's what they are or squirrels will do similar things. Um, sap suckers will do similar things. So I've, uh, I've not been convinced with all of the photos I've seen of the damage like that, but they will sometimes, you're correct, take it off of even live trees. I have a question about if there's a lot of rain as in flood or hurricanes, will ground nesting hornets emerge and be an issue? Uh, it all depends um, at what time of year and whether their flooding is enough to kill them all. So I think it's really, it really based, it's really based on the situation. Um, again, the queens will start early in the season, make a very small comb. They'll start on their own, making basically doing all the work. Once they have enough workers to start doing the work, all they do is lay the eggs. And so they will stay in the nest the entire time and all the workers will go out and collect uh, pulp for the nest making process. Uh, so it's possible they get flooded out, but I'm not sure whether they take precautions or they choose sites that are better for flooding or whatnot. It's a good question. So here's to show how big European hornets are. Uh, this one, I was on a trail in the mountains and I heard a screaming cicada and all of a sudden this thing dropped to the trail. Uh, at first I thought it might be a cicada killer, but it was actually a, ball, a, um, a European hornet. And you can see it stung it multiple times, finally killed the cicada, and then it chewed it up and took a bit of the meat back to the nest. It wasted a lot of food too, but um, I guess it was busy. So it just grabbed a bit and took it back. Uh, so they are very powerful, large insects and can take down prey items to uh, chop up and bring back to their larvae. So all of this, uh, you will probably get this question. Are Japanese Asian or Asian giant hornets in North Carolina? Every single year, I get a call about somebody has found a Japanese or Asian giant hornet. Uh, as far as this date of this recording, there are no Japanese or Asian giant hornets in North Carolina. Uh, what happens is they're often confused for other existing wasps here. So here is a picture of the a Asian giant hornet, Vesper mandarinia. Uh, the Japanese giant hornet is just a subspecies of this. And if you look, the characteristic that defines this species is that its eyes are fairly small and pushed toward the front of the head. So they have this very large cheek, basically. And you can see it right here where the eye, it's almost two eye widths from the back of the head to, the, uh, to the, where the eye starts. If you go back, if we go back to the European hornet, you can see the eye is basically the same width as that cheek. Now maybe, of course, if they're flying around, you're not gonna be able to see that character, but if you, happen to catch something and somebody thinks or brings in a wasp and thinks it's an Asian giant hornet, this is what they look like. And the interesting thing too is that the Asian giant hornet is in the genus Vespa, the same as the European hornet, uh, but it is not so much bigger than some of our native, our well, existing wasps. So the introduced European hornet is almost as big as an Asian giant hornet. And uh, the Asian giant hornet is said to be a little bit more aggressive, have a little bit more potent venom, but again, it's not much bigger. Uh, and our, our local cicada killers are much larger uh, than the Asian giant hornets. So these are often confused for Asian giant hornets, especially in the late summer when cicada killers are active. Okay, are there any I, last questions? 
I was going to mention, Matt, I saw um, some hoverflies yesterday that were larger than I usually expect for hoverflies, and they had mm. this coloration, yeah. you know, um, and when you were showing these pictures, it just made me think of that hoverfly and how people might would confuse that, but um, they didn't have the real narrowed waist, and they had the really large fly eyes. And yeah. That a little differently but um i've seen lots of hoverflies lately but really small ones but these these guys are pretty big yeah so my sister actually sent me a photo of one of them the other day too and that was uh, uh it's probably the genus milesia which the larvae live in rotting wood and the adults are very large hoverflies and do look very hornet like uh so that is correct so take a look up for that and um i'm going to uh, enter here's in the in the chat. I've put a link to a blog post I put about Asian giant hornets and you know our native ones. So if you want to read more information about them, just uh, follow that link. All right, I'm going to move on. So Mike has enough time. All right, what in the world is that? So this was found by Mike from a sample that he took uh, on the underside of a holly leaf. And uh, if you'd like to guess. You know, if you have courageous, you can type something in the chat box. I'll, uh, you know, no pressure. I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. But um, if you want, I can also zoom in. So that. So this is about the size of a Tic Tac. Um, actually, almost the same shape. Probably not as tasty. So pupil case. That's a that's a very good guess. So. Um, yeah well that's good so um it is actually a pupil case but what is it a pupil case of it's a cocoon hey there you go taylor williams got it so it's an ichneumonid this is a uh, cocoon of a certain group of ichneumonid wasps uh in this subfamily Campoplegyne. uh most are parasitoids of caterpillars and they create this pill-like cocoon near the dead host on the host plant and they think it mimics a bird dropping, so things leave it alone. Um, and some of the some other genera, uh, some genera in the subfamily uh, make this long thread, and it this cocoon hangs off the plant like that. And I heard somebody, uh, I saw somebody online describe it as a Easter egg almost, and they do look a lot like an Easter egg. But that's a fairly characteristic uh, cocoon from an ichneumonid wasp in this subfamily. So great. All right, what about that? What in the world is that? Yeah, anybody? Anybody want to take a stab at what that is? A moth. Yeah, it is. That's uh it's not too hard I guess from part of it but what moth is it it's hummingbird moth it's not a hummingbird moth but this is the subject of the next part this is actually a pickle worm moth uh, so this is a apparently female although males of some groups will have these hair pencils at the tip of the abdomen and they use those specialized scales to release pheromones and so this is uh, the subject of the next part of the talk is the pickle worm so Pickle worm is in the family Crambidae, it's Diaphania nididalis. And uh, basically this is a more tropical moth that overwinters in Florida and Texas. So North Carolina doesn't typically get them until late summer or early fall as they move up to the more Northern latitudes. Uh, it's got a month long life cycle with overlapping generations. And the females call males, like I said, with the pheromones from their hairbrush. Um, and uh, it's really just modified CD or scales. Um, and you can see a typical pickle worm moth here. It's got this kind of purplish uh, brown iridescent scales with these wavy patches of almost window-like pale uh, yellow um, uh, spots on the wings. And that'll be important in a few minutes when I talk about one other species that looks similar. Now, as their name implies, pickle worms affect cucurbits, and summer squash is apparently the most preferred. The preference of other cucurbits varies, and apparently water, watermelon is not preferred, for example. Um, but I don't know exactly all of the different varieties that are 
preferred over others, uh, but they do prefer summer squash apparently. Now here's a larva here. And if we look here, uh, young larvae are, have these distinct black spots all over them. These are really called the pinacula, which are these little warts that bear hairs. And a lot of types of caterpillars have dark pinaculae. Um, but the larvae produce copious amounts of frass and feed in flowers, as seen here, or bore into the fruit. So they may feed on flowers for a little bit. And some of the smaller flowered varieties, they'll feed on the flowers until it starts to fruit. And then uh, when the fruit is growing, they will bore inside. Fruits that are too hard, for example, cantaloupe, may have surface feeding. And sometimes there's a general group of a name for these types of caterpillars that feed on like that. And they're called rind worms, where they basically just excavate the, the surface of the melon. Now, as they get older, and this is actually what tricked me, I should mention that Mike brought these in from his garden, from his squash flowers. And as they get older, they lose their spots. So when he brought them in, I wasn't sure whether I was dealing with, uh, or he was dealing with two types of moths uh, co-inhabiting or one, just different stages. And apparently it is just one uh, was there and I reared them out for that moth. And uh, the older ones, get a lot lighter, they lose those dark spots, and then they start to contract and they pupate, and they pupate in a leaf fold. So they'll fold, and sometimes it's in dead leaf material, but they'll just uh, kind of, it's like a little sleeping bag, they'll sew it together and then pupate, and then out after about a week or so, uh, the adult will come out. And again, you can see all the frass and silk here, which is very characteristic of Lepidoptera uh, larvae, caterpillars in uh, infesting things. As far as control, um, control before August in North Carolina is not usually necessary because they are still in the south at that point. Uh, covering plants at night with screening or mesh during the late summer or early fall may prevent the moths from laying eggs. Of course, if you cover it during the day, it may prevent the fruit from setting due to uh, reduced pollinators. You could use preventive sprays or drenches uh, using approved chemistries for homeowner use. Uh, but again, scouting for the moths and making sure that they're active is, is good. You don't want to use too much of it uh, before they're even active. Uh, applica applications can be made at night to reduce bee exposure. And uh, once the larvae enter the fruit though, the control is not possible. Uh, they've already damaged it. They're going to foul the fruit. And uh, with the hole that they bore into the fruit, this can cause uh, bacterial infections and such to enter it. Now, a close relative, Diaphania hyalinata, is called the melon worm. Uh, as you can see, the adults are much, uh, pretty distinct from them. Uh, we can go back and pickle worm has these wavy, yellowish, pale yellowish patches uh, with this dark purplish brown wing. Uh, the melon worm, the base scales are fairly similar color, but it's got these very large white patches with a very large white part of the thorax and abdomen. So it looks like a big uh, triangle or trapezoid on the whole moth. So that's how you can tell the melon worm from the pickle worm, although the pickle worm is fairly distinct. Uh, there are several other species of diaphania that look just like the melon worm superficially. They have very large white patches. As far as the larvae, uh, larval melon worms, again, all these, a lot of these groups also feed on cucurbits as well, um, a lot of these species. Melon worm larvae have these very pale stripes down the body and apparently largely feed on the foliage more so than the fruit, but will invade the fruit and flowers if they feel the need to. Uh, the foliage feeding though can be severe and they can cause complete defoliation or at least skeletonizing and uh, death of the leaves where they feed. So those are two uh, moths uh, that can be present on cucurbits. And uh, the melon worm, I will say, is uh, more widely distributed, so it's more adapted to cooler weather. Uh, but pickle worm seems to be a pretty serious pest, uh, especially in late summer, early fall. Melon worm, although present in temperate regions, is also more active in the late summer and early fall. Okay, uh, any questions about pickle worm or melon worm?
Okay. Well, finally, some bolos. So late fall, early winter, of course, um, insects are not as active during the winter when it gets cold. So we don't have a lot of activity outside, but there are some things that you might encounter uh, during the next few months before our next uh, session in February. So fall canker worms. Uh, around Thanksgiving is usually the time we, we talk about uh, looking for them. These are wingless, uh, the females are wingless moths, climb up trees to lay eggs, and their inchworm caterpillars will hatch out next year and feed on the foliage. The males are winged and fly around. Um, firewood insects. So if you're bringing firewood in for the for making fires during the cool or cold winter, uh, note that the change in temperature when they uh, are brought inside, the wood is brought inside, may cause any larvae that are inside to begin to develop and a little while after may emerge from that firewood. So things like longhorn beetles like Cerambicids, also this jewel beetles like this Buprested right here, or even some of the wood boring wasps, this is a Zephydriid wood wasp, which is, related, is basically a sawfly that lives in wood. Uh, so don't freak out, don't think that your house is infested. Uh, these are just probably coming from the firewood, especially if you've just brought in firewood, that's a good uh, idea that that might be the source. Also Christmas tree insects. Uh, we get a lot of calls of, and uh, samples of very large black aphids uh, in the genus Cinera, the conifer aphids. When the trees are brought into the house, the aphids are happy. When the trees start to dry out, the aphids are not so happy and they will leave the tree in mass numbers and people freak out thinking their home is infested by something. So do note that Christmas trees will bring various insects in with them. Uh, I can't tell you which ones because it could be almost anything that can reside in a Christmas tree for safety or, or shelter. And once it warms up in the house, they are happy to move around. Lastly, household invaders are still active, uh, at least for now. So stink bugs, ladybugs, uh, box elder bugs, some other things are going to start coming into houses. But uh, once it gets so cold and they've already settled, they're gonna be less active. You're not gonna notice them as much. Of course, when it starts to warm up in the spring again, that's when you may see activity again. All righty. Um, well, that's all I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know in the chat box. And otherwise, I will turn it over to Mike. All right. Thanks, Matt. I see. Is that seven in the chat box? Are those things that have already been addressed? That looks like a half. Yes. All right. Um, if I share my screen, will it bump you off? Yeah, it looks like it will. All right, hold on. So can everyone see? Oh, yeah, it doesn't look like we want what I want there. Hold on. Apologize for this. Let me try and figure out which is the correct screen that I want to share here. All right, um, are you seeing two mystery photos or just one? We see one, it says mystery photo one. It's a branch and it's got some black stuff on it. Okay, all right. Uh, for some reason on my screen here, my main screen, it's showing a piece of the mystery photo two as well on the side. So we'll just, we'll just roll with it here. I am going to talk about uh, just briefly the uh, answers to these two mystery photos, but I'm going to have some slides in between. I'll let anyone who'd like, though, to go ahead and offer in the chat a suggestion as to what this might be.
would it matter what the plant species is it's on? Um, it will partially matter, but we'll just, um, let's see, this one was, I believe this was Nissa. And I'll, and I'll explain later why it's, it partially matters and partially doesn't. All right, no, no takers. We'll, we'll move on to mystery photo two then. Mystery and photo number two, anyone have an idea of what this might be? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, didn't the uh, chats didn't pop up. Some other, some people suggested uh, sooty mold or borer frass uh, and black sooty mold. Well, you're close in a way, but not quite. And now mystery photo two. This one is highly magnified, that's a clue. All right, well, we will leave that one then as a mystery for now. I'm gonna start out by asking you folks for whether or not you've seen something. And the way I wanna do this is put up a map of the state and then ask you to, if you go up to your view options, on your Zoom screen, there's an annotate tool. And within that, there's one called stamp. And I want you to use the, choose the check stamp if the, and put it over your county if the answer is yes to the following question and an X if the answer is no. So take a moment to find your annotation tools, specifically the stamp tool and the two possibilities there. I see someone found the check and is checking the check and the X. All right, very good. So on the next screen then, the question is, have you seen boxwood blight this year? I've seemed to have started a tradition of in our last month of the year, doing a little boxwood blight summary. It's interesting, we've got, this is very interesting actually. Got a couple of finds in Johnson County and a little further east. And no reports one way or the other, or a few from the mountains. Maybe just another moment to add to this. All right, well, from the standpoint of the clinic, this is what we saw. The counties in the maroon color are where we had diagnoses in the clinic of homewood, uh, homewood, boxwood in home landscapes with boxwood blight. So this doesn't count the nursery finds. The yellow or gold colored counties are those in which boxwood blight has been reported at some point since it was introduced, but not this past year. And the green counties are where we have not seen it yet so far. So I was very interested to see, it looks like three counties that have green checks where they've observed it, but they have not been on our radar yet. So if uh, those of you who did that, whose, whose green check falls in a green county would uh, contact me later, I'd be interested in hearing more about it just via email. So 
at least from our uh, data collection this year, which is biased based on what people do send in, the boxwood blight was occurring in mountains and some of the northern foothill counties. And one thing to be aware of, this is a kind of a pre-bolo here, is that occasionally boxwood blight will come in on holiday greenery. These twigs and leaves are from wreaths that the Department of Agriculture collected in a couple of places, the NCDA, in their scouting for this disease in, in boxwood greenery. On the left was from November of 2017, so two years ago in, uh, in a Christmas tree lot in Wake County, actually in the town where I live. And on the right was from uh, Guilford County a retail store in December of 2014. So we typically talk about those three symptoms. If you see two out of the three, then you know you've got boxwood blighter with a pretty high certainty. The brown leaf spots, the dark streaks on the green twigs, and the defoliation. Although you'll notice on the picture on the right, it's not the discrete brown leaf spots so much as just kind of general wilting and graying out of the spots. But the other two symptoms are clearly there, the defoliation and those dark streaks on the stems. With that, I want to mention a couple of diseases that you need to be watching for now. They both have the word black in the common name and the first line of defense against them in both cases, making sure that you bring tr clean transplants into the garden. So here, I'm going to leave it to you to come up with a name as I present a few clues. So here's a picture of a, a collard leaf. And this is a disease that affects cabbage, collards, kale, and their relatives. It's caused by the bacterium Xanthomonas campestris. And typically we see these uh, yellow and necrotic spots very often in a V shape from the edge of the leaf on the margin, but in this case it's not really predominantly there. But sometimes it'll go systemic and you'll see actually darkening of the veins in the affected areas. So does somebody want to say, oh, you've already come at uh, Taylor, uh, Ashley agrees, Sean Bank, uh, Sean Banks, excuse me, Sean, black rot. Yes, this is black rot of crucifers. Again, this is a, a bacterial disease. Notice on the left there, that more of a classic V-shaped marginal spot. And it's really important when you're getting any of these plants, whether it be the edible the edible crucifers or even your flowering kale at this time of year to make sure that you're bringing clean transplants into the garden. Uh, oh, fortunately, before I go on, the uh, bacterium doesn't persist in the soil. So once the plant material has broken down completely, then that bacterium will die out. That's one of the reasons why this is a, a disease that you may get some benefit from crop rotation. Our next disease with the name black in it that you want to look out for it infects the roots and sometimes into the lower stems. It's caused by a fungus that until recently we called the Laviopsis basicola. I'll give you the new name in a moment. And it's usually characterized by a yellowing and poor growth rather than an outright wilting like we see with, for example, Pythium root rot or Phytophthora root rot. The big host this time of year, of course, would be pansies, but there are many herbaceous perennials that are susceptible, and even Japanese holly is quite often infected. And I see that a couple of folks have already chimed in and suggested that black root rot is the name of it, and that is, in fact, the case. The picture on the right are the alluria spores, they're called. They're the resting spores that allow this to survive in the absence of a host and very distinctive. They look like little Tootsie Rolls even break off into segments like that. We would find these in the, in the roots when we look under the microscope. Often the root system isn't as completely covered as in this example. These were columbine plants, I believe. But you'll, and you'll have to sometimes look carefully and dig around in the roots before you can find them. Now the new name for this is Brachelliomyces basicola. I am not exactly sure of uh, why the name change occurred. I assume that they just found enough differences with other species of Thalaviopsis that they decided it needed to be in its own genus and, and uh, put it here. 
So if you see the name Berkeliomyces bicicola, just remember that's the old Flaviopsis bicicola, the cause of black root rot. Another disease that's common most of the year is Entomosporium leaf spot, and it has the following characteristics. Pathogen is called Diplocarpin mespilii, which used to be Entomosporium mespilii. Um, difference there between the sexual and the asexual stage, and I'll show you some pictures of the spores in a moment, and you can see why it has the name Entomosporium. Most commonly, we'll see it on red tip Photinia or on Indian Hawthorn, although some other plants can also be affected within the Rosaceae pair, for example. Very typical symptoms. They're small spots, red and, or with red borders, turning gray in the centers, and leaf drop occurring. Sometimes the entire leaf will go red before it drops off. And if you look carefully or with your hand lens, you'll see small gray blister-like fruiting bodies in the middle of these spots. So if you see those reddish spots on Indian hawthorn, you're pretty sure that you've got entomosporium leaf spot. But once you see those blister-like fruiting bodies on them, then you've got your diagnosis. This overwinters in uh, living leaves and twigs. So it's not one where you're gonna worry so much about the fallen leaves and twigs. Uh, I'm sorry, the fallen leaves but the, the living ones. And it's most active at temperatures between 55 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which of course is we spend, where we spend most of the year here in North Carolina. So it's gonna be active in throughout the spring, maybe shut down some, slow down some in the heat of the summer, reactivate in the fall, and then again in the dead of winter will be less active. But since these plants are evergreen, we'll tend to see the symptoms throughout the year. And dispersion, uh, or dispersal of the, the spores is through water splash from the infected foliage onto healthy leaves. And management consists of using less susceptible cultivars of Indian hawthorn. We had some here on campus where the less susceptible ones just finally faded out and were removed and kind of taken over by the adjacent, um, actually the more susceptible ones had such bad disease that they grew poorly and the Eventually, eventually the less susceptible ones adjacent took over their place. Sometimes heavy pruning is recommended in the winter time to reduce the amount of inoculum on those living leaves and stems. And a general recommendation would be do not plant red tip Photinia. Of course, it was used a lot as a hedge, a screen in the past, but once it defoliates, once you've got a good infestation by this fungus, there's really nothing that you can do about it except remove it and start over with something else. All right. I see. Mike, I think there was a comment in the chat. Uh, I noticed something similar on my Sasanqua. I'm not sure what that would be. If you could send a picture of it, that would be that would be good. We could see what it what it might be. Just submit it to the to the clinic database. I don't know off the top of my head anything on Sasanqua that looks like that. All right. And what I see happened was on my my slide, I must have had the hidden the slide hidden with the photomicrograph of the spores. The reason this is called entomosporium is because the spores have a little bit of a look like kind of an insect. They're multi-celled and have CD on them, so they kind of have a entomological look and and this, thus the name. All right, going back to our mystery photos here. Mystery photo one, some said that they thought it was sooty mold and you're kind of close in the sense that it's an insect associated fungus, but in this case, it's not just growing on the honeydew dropping from the sucking insects, but this is actually colonizing the colonies of scale insects. It's common as we start to see the leaves fall off when we get a look at the branches of our trees, um, Mostly you'll see it on smoother bark type trees. Nissa is pretty common. Uh, I've seen it on maple, I've seen it on oak. We've had it submitted on holly. And the color can be different. So the one on Nissa seems to be very dark. There are different species. Um, I think you have a picture, I think I show it later in the bolos on holly, which is a much lighter color to it, kind of a buff tone. So it can be different in its, uh, in its coloration. Again, tends to be on 
smooth bark trees, but not necessarily, and is associated with insect colonies. And I'm going to ask Matt if he can chime in there as to what the latest is on really the relationship of the fungus to the insects. Yeah, so um, they're only found on armored scales. So that's, that's, it's only specific to armored scales. And if you were to basically take any of those little spots and kind of uh, scrape it off, the, you know, the tissue would be green underneath, it's not affecting the plant, and you should find armored scales under each of these patches. Um, and I don't know, I think there's still, the, the jury's out uh, whether it's a mutual relationship where the armored scales get protection from the fungus and then some of them get eaten by the fungus or it's a parasitic and, you know, the fungus almost always just kills the scales. Uh, but I also have seen um, other fungi, parasitic fungi on scales, this orange one, a type of nectria type fungus popping out of even the septobacidium mats. And so you've got all these fungi competing for the armored scales. And again, this is because this is a scale issue, treating the scales will help to reduce the amount of fungus. And I think, Matt, you um, pointed out, didn't you, that you've seen wasp parasitized scales underneath the septobacidium mat, is that right? Um, I, I may have before, I don't remember, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's possible. And, uh, but yeah, oftentimes I try and, take off the fungus and a lot of the scales are just dead. And so I have a feeling that the scales are getting the short end of the stick on this relationship. All right, and uh, Taylor had a question there of whether they grow on gloomy scale. I have not seen them on gloomy scale that I, I know, but the fact that I've seen it on maple, I guess that's a possibility, but yeah, the, I, next, the next time I see it on maple, I'll have to bring it and you can identify the scale. Yeah, now. I haven't really, um, and there's another question about the consumed scale. Yes, the fungus actually eats the scales. Um, and uh, do they grow, grow in gloomy scale? I have never noticed that. Um, I, I, it may be, but I most, like Mike said, Nyssa, I commonly, we commonly see it on hollies, things like that. Uh, I've even seen on red bud, a sample came in with red bud, but uh, gloomy scale, typically the uh, bark of trees infested with that get much darker, like it has a fungus, but I think that's just kind of, um, uh, material or just kind of <laughs> gloominess from the scales. They, the, but the gloomy scales do, gloomy scale does get the little orange fungi. And so that's often when you see those little orange spots all over, people then actually notice the gloomy scales. But as far as septobacidium, I don't, I don't recall ever seeing it on gloomy scale. And there's enough gloomy scale out there that you think we'd, we would have by now if it were at all common. All right, Matt, you've got another question there. Yes, let's see. So are oils, neem oil effective uh, this time of year? Yes, of course oils are, you want to use when they go into dormancy more uh, and when the weather gets cooler. Uh, it can help uh, with them, uh, but I think it's uh, just a, a matter that some of the trees, if they're too large to treat, you may not get good coverage. Um, and basically, some of the bottom, some of the lower areas that are look highly infested, maybe old colonies or dead colonies, and more of the active colonies are going to be up in the branches and places like that. So um, I don't know all the ins and outs about control of these scales. I think there are some other types of chemicals or things you can use, but um, I can get back to you if you have more specific questions. Just uh, let me know. All right. Now, our mystery photo two which no one bit on. This is actually a highly magnified picture of a needle of a Leyland cypress and the little olive colored tufts there are the sporulation of the fungus Passolora sequoiae, which, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's misspelled. There should be another E at the end of that. Um, this is a fairly common disease and it's, just to make sure it's not confused with ceridium canker, which occurs on some of the same hosts, I have a comparison slide in this next one here. So Passolora needle blight, you'll see the problem is starting in the lower portion of the tree 
moving up and from the inside moving out where that humidity is highest and the fungus is, is reproducing and infecting. It's killing individual needles. So you can see that clearly on the one photograph there of the Leyland twig and less so, but you see the, the, num the numerous needles that have been killed on the Monterey cypress in the lower left there. But also notice that the new growth is healthy. So it's the individual needles that, that it were killed, but the newest ones have not yet been infected or at least aren't yet symptomatic. And you'll get this, this browning out as the symptom. Leyland cypress is a very common host, but we can also see it on other species and eastern red cedar and even a few other things in the, in the Cupressaceae. You probably guessed from the name Pastelaria sequoia that uh, even redwood is a host. Now, Ceridium canker is sort of the mirror image of that. Instead of the youngest needles being healthy and the older ones dying, what you've got is the tips of the branches that are dead because of the girdling effect of the fungus that killed the, the twig at the base of what you see as the diseased area. And these are often gonna be an orange sort of coloration to them. Of course, they'll fade out over time. Where our two hosts that we really see this on are Leyland cypress and also Italian cypress. So these are two very common needle and twig problems on our Cupressaceae but they're sort of, the symptoms are sort of mirror images of one another. So once you know that, to distinguish that, you can pretty much tell which is which. And that brings me to the bolos for the late fall and through the winter until we meet again in February. Um, trees and shrubs, we've already mentioned a few of these before. Boxwood blight, never let your guard down on that one. Septibacidium or felt fungus, and there's the picture it was taken by Brad. I believe he's on the call even today um, from Holly there. Notice that's more of a cream colored or a buff colored Septibacidium mat on that Holly versus the dark one we saw on the Nyssa earlier. Entomosporium leaf spot that we talked about, the photo at the, at the bottom there. Uh, Cercospora, or really more likely a Pseudocercospora leaf spot on Ligustrum. As other trees drop their leaves, we'll be paying more attention to our humble ligustrums and you'll often see these diffuse large yellow blotches on the leaves and that very well could be the fungus Pseudus or Cospor causing that. Rhizosphere needle cast on the spruces especially and we've talked about those recently in the program. Phytophthora root rot and armillaria root rot. Again the time that you see the symptoms may correspond more to the time when the tree is under stress or the shrub is under stress than the actual height of activity of the causal organism, the, the Phytophthora in one case and the Armillaria in another. But we can start see, we can see trees with symptoms at any time of the year. Black knot on cherry and plum will start to be more noticeable as again, the leaves fall off those growths, those galls that have kind of a dark and rough look to them. And of course, we'll be seeing the mistletoe as the leaves of our oaks and so on fall down. And especially, um, they don't really do much damage to oaks. They're, they're mostly a hazard if they happen to be hanging over a doorway that you're standing under at a holiday gathering. So keep an eye out there too. And I should have put the, I didn't put on the list, but the Pasilor needle blight, there's a picture on the left there from Christy of a pretty serious damage to a Leyland hedge in Swain County. That was Pasilora needle blight on, on that. Uh, not too many things in the vegetable garden over the winter, but uh, basically it's crucifers. Keep an eye out for sclerotinia stem rot, which you see there on the right. You can even see on the petiole on the far right there, a little tuft of the mycelium starting to form. You could see sclerotia, the dark resting bodies there developing on those as well, but uh, a rot. Black rot we've already uh, talked about earlier today. There's another disease called white spot, which you may see on turnip and Swiss chard. And I put it in parentheses because it's probably not going to be something you'll see very often in a home garden situation, but downy mildew is another disease that can occur on our crucifers. In the flower beds, uh, black root rot of pansy and viola to be watching for. Again, be careful that you're putting transplants in that are, that are free of this. Seems to be a good year this year. I haven't really seen much. I don't even think I got one sample from a, from a greenhouse or nursery this fall of, of pansy with this disease. So that's, that's good, but doesn't mean you don't want to be vigilant. As we start getting into the 
warmer, wetter part of the late winter, you may see Botrytis blight on pansies, pictured there on the, on the right, excuse me. The same sclerotinia can, that affects the, uh, the crucifers can also occur on some other things, mainly it would be snapdragon. Not very common, but uh, it's something that may happen in the, in the winter, late winter and early spring in the flower garden. Cold injury, of course, if we get temperatures that are dropping suddenly or have gotten extreme. And our perennial issue on liriope, the anthracnose on the leaf tips, that is the reason you want to make sure and give those their haircut in the late winter and start with clean, fresh growth in the spring. Finally, for turf, and again, this is not my area of expertise, but relying on some of the ones that Lee Butler has compiled there. While the warm season turf hasn't quite gone dormant yet, so you still may see some cases of large patch, which occurs when the warmer season grasses are under stress from the cooler weather. Leaf spot could still be occurring. There's an interesting disease called red thread, which I didn't show a stand symptom of, but you can see the close up of, I believe these are actually a, a strange form of sclerotium that develops on the, on the grass or can develop there. And the last three, fairy ring, microdokin patch, and yellow patch are ones that you could see throughout the winter. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Right, Mart was asking control for needle blight. Uh, I assume that you're talking about the Passolora. That one, there are chemical controls that can be used. For a large tree, of course, it's not gonna be really practical. Um, but there, if you look in the NCI chem manual, it actually, I haven't checked this last one, but in the past, there's been a scheme there worked out where you look for symptoms at two different times a year. I believe it's in May and then later at one point in the summer. And you look for that sporulation on the needles with your hand lens. And if you see that, then it's the time to make some, some fungicide applications. So that information should be there in the, in the NC Ag Chem Manual. I don't know of any other than, of course, reducing leaf wetness if that's possible, uh, possibly by doing some pruning to let air circulate better in the, in the canopy but I don't know of any, for example, resisted cultivars of any of these hosts against Passolora, although I believe that there is a research program looking into that, and I don't know how far along that's gotten. So there's not, there's not a whole lot that can be done there. All right, any other questions? So we'll, I guess we'll turn it back over to Charlotte then. All right, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Matt. Another great season coming to an end. We'll finish up um, today's session. I'm not sure if you can see it. Are you seeing the slide that has the aromatic aster? Yes, we are. Uh, I think oh, there's right. one more question for Mike. Okay, yep. Any tips for preventing bacterial soft rot on brass brassicas? Mike, you want to jump on that one? Sure. Uh, the soft rot can be something that happens as uh, kind of secondary to the black rot infection. So you're, the first thing would be to make sure that you prevent black rot. The second thing would be to prevent any kind of uh, physical injury because our, typically our, our bacterial soft rots, um, at least the ones I experience, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I haven't worked with them in the veggies, but in the ornamentals, it's often associated with some kind of a physical wound. So anything you can do to keep mechanical injury, insect injury, and primary disease like a bacteria, uh, black rot will help you to reduce the amount of uh, bacterial soft rot. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, well, we're gonna close out the season with um, our plant of the month, which is aromatic aster. And I've just dropped some links into the chat list that um, you can click on to learn more. Um, 
but aromatic aster is uh, used to be an aster, now it's symphiotrichal. <laughs> so the aster family or genus was kind of torn apart and put into many different sections. So this end up in Sophiotrichum oblongifolium. And it is a wonderful plant for gardens all across North Carolina. I have grown it in the coastal plain and the Piedmont. Um, it's actually native to the Appalachian Mountains and kind of west to the Rockies. So through the, the Great Plains and, and even up into the Northeast some. Um, but it is extremely adaptable. It is a sun lover, so it's gonna be happier in sun. It is drought tolerant, so it's going to be happy in well-drained soil and even sandy soils. Um, and pollinators absolutely love it. And I have seen so many bees, um, both um, bumblebees and other native bees and honeybees on it in the last few weeks. The picture here on the screen is from my garden this weekend. And this is also the plant I've been seeing so many hoverflies on. Um, hoverflies or surfed flies are a beneficial insect, particularly their larvae. Um, feed on aphids, which I have actually been finding their larvae on the aphids on my kale. So got a full life cycle going there. Um, and it's really wonderful for pollinators because it is a late bloomer. So those, those late bloomers and early bloomers, the things that really fill out the season, maybe when there's not as much of other stuff blooming, um, are, are wonderful for providing an ongoing food source for pollinators. Um, if you go to buy it, you'll probably find one of the cultivars, um, either Raiden's favorite, which is a little more upright, or October Skies, which is a little bit shorter. Um, and it, uh, these heights I've put really are it growing in a, a good uh, enriched soil, fairly moist. Um, so if you haven't really sandy sites, they probably won't quite get as tall as I've listed. Um, for three foot on Raiden's favorite and two foot on October skies. But they do tend to make mounds and um, kind of a mounded plant. And you do need to give them plenty of space because they, they will spread out. Um, the plant makes a mat. So over time it, it gets a little wider, but it's not rhizomatous at all. You're not, you don't need to worry about it sending roots and, and just popping up all throughout the garden. And compared to many of the other asters you find in garden centers, um, this time of year, it has great resistance to a lot of common foliage diseases. Um, I've, I've heard mention of powdery mildew on it, but I have not seen powdery mildew on it. Um, in my garden, I don't see a lot of the leaf spot and other things that you get on like the New England asters. Um, and it just tends to look healthier by this time of year. I think some of that's because of its drought tolerance. Um, so it is a wonderful plant. And if you're looking for something for late season color and you're looking for something that's gonna support pollinators and beneficial insects, um, you definitely want to check this plant out. All it needs is a little bit of sun. And just a reminder that if you are not subscribed to the um, email list, I think I'm going to drop it. Yeah, I just dropped several things in the chat. Um, our moderated email list, this is a great way to keep up with announcements. Um, you can click on the link and it lets you put your email address in and subscribe. And um, and you'll get announcements when the new season starts next year. We'll, and, and our schedule gets posted, you'll get an announcement about that and any other upcoming events we have planned, such as our Search for Excellence celebration, <clears throat> excuse me, which is coming up on November 13th. Um, an announcement about this went out last week to the email list. And it's also posted on NCSU Garden on the statewide site. Um, and of course, there'll be some reminders closer to the date, but it will be a Zoom session, just like our plants, pests, and pathogens. And during this Search for Excellence celebration, you will hear from our Search for Excellence projects, our Master Gardener volunteers who are involved with the project you see listed on the, on the screen. And um, they will tell you uh, what, what the project was about, kind of what it took to make it happen, um, any lessons they've learned, and um, this could help you, inspire you, things you could do new in your county or um, just give you a, a better idea of what's going on across the state and that's what Master Gardener volunteers are doing um, around North Carolina. And, and of course we say congratulations to all of our winners as well. The um, Search for Excellence does come with a monetary award. The um, selected project for each category gets $200 that goes to their program to help support uh, the, the project that was submitted or just other outreach that Master Gardener volunteers are involved in. And um, those funds come from the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Endowment, 
um, which does help support the work of Master Gardener volunteers across the state. And we are currently having a, a appeal since it is the 40 year anniversary of Extension Master Gardener program in North Carolina. Um, and you know, our, our goal is we'd love to raise $40,000. That would almost double what we have in the endowment and the principal. So nearly double our um, interest and um, we're getting close, we're, we've, we're around the $6,000 mark um, now. And so just from recent donations and um, we encourage you to think about going into the fall or winter, either as a group or individually, if you're able to make a donation, it is, it is greatly appreciated and it does help grow the future of the program. And we'll continue to give back to Master Gardener volunteers across the state forever. Um, another great way to support the endowment is to purchase a Master Gardener license plate. And actually, if you look at um, our income for the endowment um, that goes into the principal over the years, our license plates have been the biggest kind of continuing um, fundraiser for the, for the endowment. Because when you purchase it, it's an extra $20 on top of the normal fees for purchasing a license plate. Um, but 10 of that, so half of it goes straight to the endowment and we get four lump sum payments a year from DMV. And um, so it's a wonderful way to show your pride as a, a Master Gardener volunteer and to, um, to have this kind of that ongoing giving $10 a year. And um, right now what's in stock are still the um, older logo with the watering can that you see on the screen. But once those run out, they will be updated to the new logo. And um, also just wanted to express appreciation to the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association for the role they played in getting the license plate um, available through DMV, making sure we had enough people interested in it and continuing to promote it and support the endowment. Then even though this is our last live session for the season, um, you can still enjoy plants, pests, and pathogens all year round by visiting our playlist on YouTube. You can find recordings all the way back to 2009 up to the present. Um, we do now have a recording index page. I'm gonna put these links in the chat as well that will let you look um, chronologically at all of the recordings that are available and it will list the speakers um, so from that recording index page, you could do a, a search, you could do control F, and um, if you're looking for a specific topic to see if there's ever been anything, say, on perennials or fruit trees, you could just search that term and, and, and see what you find there among the index. Um, so that's another way, as well as looking chronologically, that you could, you could use that site. And then, of course, our current schedule and archive is also posted. Um, it's on the Extension Gardener portal, but the link here will take you directly to it. And that will be where the new season um, schedule is posted as soon as we get, get, um, get that up and going. So it'll probably be next January before we get that updated and get everybody lined up, but you'll be able to find it there. Also, if you are looking for um, education opportunities, especially as we get more of these rainy days. Um, be sure to check out the recordings from the Extension Master Gardener College. The keynote sessions were recorded and they are posted online. You can see the link. I'll drop that in right now. Um, that'll take you straight to the page where they're posted. This is on the EMGV portal and this is a public website. So these are actually available to the public. Um, but you can see our three keynote presentations, which were from Dr. Gary Moore, who talked about the history of the Extension Master Gardener Program and Land Grant College system and extension. It's a wonderful talk, um, as well as Dr. Larry Mellenchamp's talk on why I grow native plants. And then uh, Mark Wethington from the J.C. Ralston Arboretum talked about gardening in the South. Um, so those are, are each about an hour long or a little bit over, and I really encourage you to take advantage of them. And just want to mention as well that, that it cost almost $1,400 to record those and have them processed. And that was made possible through our donors, our financial donors, um, sponsors, BioAdvance, Black Cow and I Must Garden, and the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association who generated those sponsorships for us. So um, appreciation both to the sponsors who donated the funds and the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association for um, generating that funding for us. 
All right, just, uh, just one or two last things. Um, just a reminder to mark it on your calendar. It's a little ways out. It's over, it's uh, about two years away, but the International Master Gardener Conference, September 12th through 17th will be in 2021 up in Norfolk, Virginia. And normally we would hold another extension Master Gardener College. We'd be doing those every other year, but um, with the International Master Gardener College so close, we definitely want to encourage everybody to attend. So in 2021, we will just be focusing on um, promoting the International Master Gardener Conference and hoping everybody can attend that um, instead of offering our own multiple day EMG college. Um, but we are looking to line up Extension Master Gardener College again for 2022. All right, and as Matt and Mike have mentioned, we will be back in February uh, next year, and we look forward to seeing you then. We wish you very happy gardening um, until then, and always remember um, you can catch up or review sessions from this year and all years past um, from our playlist or from the recording index. And so we are finishing out the year, not only on time, but finishing up a little bit early. I appreciate everyone who's attended this year, and um, we've got a minute or two for any last questions. If anybody wants to unmute their mic or put anything in the chat box, seeing lots of thank yous, and I just return that to everybody. Thank you so much for being part of Plants, Pests, and Pathogens this year. Thank you to Janine Kaiser with Extension IT for the support she's provided. It has been tremendously helpful. I'm going to go ahead and play the music um, to send this out, but we'll hang out on the chat for a few minutes in case anybody has a question that comes up. So wishing you all the very best um, for the, the weeks and months to come. <laughs>